Let's get started. Number 10, Stone Age Superfood Myths. Picture this. You're sitting around a fire 10,000 years ago, chewing on something that tastes like a shoe sole dipped in campfire ash. The elders insist it's a superfood that gives strength to hunters. In reality, it was probably just the only thing available that didn't immediately kill them. Ancient cultures were full of miracle foods, believed to grant power, stamina, fertility, long life. Basically everything except a tax refund. Civilizations everywhere claimed their favorite root, Berry or fermented swamp yogurt was the ultimate source of vitality. Yet when modern nutritional science finally took a peek at these sacred snacks, the results became hilarious. For example, the ancient Greeks believed raw onions boosted courage before battle. So thousands of warriors marched into war smelling like a salad left in the sun. But scientifically, onions do nothing for bravery unless your enemy retreats to avoid your breath. Then there's the Roman obsession with garum, a fermented fish sauce so intense it could knock out a mid-sized mammal. They used it as medicine for everything, headaches, stomach issues, romantic problems. Today we know garum's healing powers came from salt, not ancient fish juice magic. But the funniest part? Many superfoods were labeled powerful simply because they didn't cause immediate diarrhea. When half your diet can launch you into gastrointestinal combat, anything that stays politely inside your body feels like a blessing from the gods. Modern science has debunked nearly all of these claims. No, ancient grains aren't immortal life seeds. And no, chewing tree bark won't give you spiritual enlightenment. Though to be fair, if you willingly eat tree bark, you definitely transcend something. The real wisdom here isn't the food, it's the creativity. Ancient people looked at their limited options and told themselves the most inspiring lie ever invented. This tastes terrible, so it must be healthy. Turns out some beliefs survived thousands of years. Number nine, the five element universe. Imagine waking up one morning and confidently announcing the entire universe is made of five things, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. Congratulations, you're now an ancient philosopher and also scientifically incorrect in literally every way. For thousands of years, civilizations from China to Greece believed the cosmos ran on a tidy elemental recipe. Everything, storms, diseases, personality types, heartbreak, could supposedly be explained by these five, or four, magical building blocks. If your love life fell apart, maybe your fire element was too low. If you got sick, maybe your water element was jealous. It was basically astrology, but with more pottery. To be fair, ancient thinkers weren't dumb. They were just working with limited tools, zero chemistry labs, and a lot of imagination. When you don't have a microscope, earth plus fire, want everything, feels like a reasonable theory. Then modern science stepped in, cracked its knuckles and said, actually, the universe is built from 118 elements, not five, and most of them don't care about your relationship problems. Atomic theory shattered the tidy elemental worldview. Stars forge heavy elements through nuclear fusion, not because their fire essence is in a mood. Water isn't an element, it's hydrogen and oxygen holding hands. Metals aren't cosmic archetypes, they're atoms arranged in highly specific crystalline structures. Still, the five element model did get one thing right, the idea that nature is a system of interactions. They just oversimplified it to the point where a third grader with a periodic table can dunk on them. Modern science now shows a universe filled with quantum fields, dark matter, chaotic energy, and 13 billion year old stellar fireworks, not wood and metal arguing over who controls your spleen. But the most ironic part, despite being disproven, the ancient elemental model still lives on today. In acupuncture charts, personality quizzes, fantasy video games, and every anime that insists someone can master all five. If only real chemistry were that cool. Number eight, bloodletting as balance. Imagine going to the doctor because you feel tired, a little dizzy, maybe stressed. And the doctor and wearing peak medieval confidence spy says, ah, yes, you have too much blood. Let's remove some. This wasn't a fringe idea. For nearly 2000 years, doctors genuinely believed illness came from imbalances in the body's four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. If you were sick, the logic was simple. Drain something until you weren't. Congratulations, medicine used to be professional vampire cosplay. The reasoning came from ancient Greek models that tried to explain the body without microscopes, germ theory, or the slightest clue about how circulation works. Galen, one of history's most influential physicians, basically said, blood causes fever, remove the blood. And everyone said, sounds legit because science at the time was mostly guesswork delivered confidently. Fast forward to modern hematology, and we now know blood is not a chaotic fluid that overheats your soul. 
It's a complex transport system carrying oxygen, nutrients, immune cells, hormones. Basically the reason you're alive and not a decorative skeleton. When you drain it, your immune system tanks. Your oxygen levels crash. Your brain starts sending sad error messages. You don't get cured. You get closer to becoming a historical cautionary tale. George Washington famously died after doctors drained 40% of his blood trying to treat a sore throat. Modern medicine calls that catastrophic blood loss. Medieval doctors called it Tuesday. So why did bloodletting stick around so long? Because people occasionally got slightly better afterward. Not because the treatment worked, but because the illness had already peaked, or because placebo is powerful, or because the doctor stopped before accidentally ending you. Survivorship bias at its finest. Today, the only legitimate form of bloodletting is donating blood, which actually saves lives, mostly because hospitals don't pour leeches into people anymore and call it wisdom. Ancient medicine meant well. Modern medicine means please stop stabbing patients to balance their imaginary humors. Number seven, cursed air and bad spirits. Picture this. You're walking into a medieval town, minding your business, when someone yells, don't go down that street. The air is cursed, not polluted, not dirty, cursed, as in, Invisible spirits floating around like malicious Wi-Fi signals waiting to delete you. For centuries, people believed diseases came from miasma, bad air filled with evil vapors. If a place smelled foul, it wasn't bacteria causing trouble. It was the universe telling you that the air had turned demonic and was about to ruin your week. Scientifically, they weren't totally clueless. Awful smells were often connected to poor sanitation. But the explanation they used? Absolutely unhinged. Plague. Rotten air spirits cholera, the river ghosts are angry, malaria, night air is poisonous. Meanwhile, mosquitoes in the swamp, quietly doing all the real murder. People burned herbs, carried flowers, and wore plague doctor masks stuffed with spices. Not for style, though honestly iconic, but because they thought aromatic air scared away death. Spoiler, eucalyptus oil does not defeat bacteria. Then modern microbiology arrived, shrugged, and explained the real villains microorganisms, tiny life forms that invade your body like microscopic burglars. Germ theory obliterated centuries of miasma, fears overnight. It wasn't cursed air. It was pathogens having a party in your bloodstream. But here's the twist. The old belief stuck around longer than you'd expect. Why? That because you can't see germs. Humans trust their eyes far more than science. Bad smell. Danger felt intuitive. Invisible microbes felt like dark wizardry. Even today, people still say things like, I don't trust that air. It feels sick. Ancient instincts never fully die. The truth is simple. Air isn't cursed. It just occasionally carries microscopic assassins that don't care about your essential oil collection. Number six, the brain is a heat furnace myth. Imagine telling someone today, your thoughts work better when your brain heats up like an oven. They'd block you, report you, and maybe recommend a therapist. But for thousands of years, this was accepted wisdom. Ancient medical theory insisted the brain wasn't the seat of intelligence. It was a cooling organ, a biological radiator. The skull? Basically an early AC system. They believed thinking happened in the heart, which did the emotional heavy lifting while the brain just sat there like a wet sponge, preventing you from overheating. If you felt confused, your brain was too warm. If you fainted, your brain was overcooled. If you had deep thoughts, people assumed your heart was having a dramatic monologue. It sounds ridiculous, but... To be fair, ancient thinkers didn't have fMRI scans or neuroscience. They saw steam coming from injured heads. They saw fever causing delirium. They drew one conclusion. Heat, espalmed, broken thoughts. Which, honestly, is still true for anyone trying to do math in summer without air conditioning. Enter modern neuroscience, the giant reality slap we all needed. Today we know the brain is an electrical and chemical powerhouse that manages every conscious and unconscious process. It doesn't cool the body. If anything, the body cools it, because those neurons run hotter than people think. And thinking doesn't come from the heart. The heart has two jobs, pump blood and betray you during awkward moments. The irony? The brain actually uses so much energy that it does generate heat, just not enough to bake a loaf of bread or explain heartbreak. Ancient wisdom got half a clue, then sprinted confidently in the wrong direction. Still, the myth lingered for centuries because it made intuitive sense. Fever makes thoughts fuzzy, cold water on the head boosts alertness. Humans love theories that feel true, even when science later goes, sweetie, no. So here we are. The brain isn't a cooling device, the heart isn't a philosopher, and ancient doctors were basically guessing with the confidence of a man who refuses to read instructions. 
Number 5. Memory Stored in the Heart Here's a fun historical glitch. For centuries, people believed your memories, your personality, your intelligence, basically everything that makes you you, lived inside your heart. The brain, that weird gray blob, a useless accessory, a biological helmet liner. Ancient scholars genuinely thought the brain was just cushioning for the skull while the heart handled all the complex thinking. Need proof of how committed they were to this? In ancient Egypt, during mummification, they removed the brain through the nose with a hook, nightmare fuel, and tossed it away. But the heart? Treated like a sacred USB drive storing your entire identity. This idea lasted absurdly long. People swore love came from the heart. Bravery came from the heart. Memory lived in the heart. If you forgot something, maybe your heart just wasn't strong enough today. That's not science. That's a motivational poster. So, what finally killed the myth? Accidentally. Doctors started noticing that head injuries dramatically changed people's behavior, memory, personality. Meanwhile, stabbing someone in the heart changed exactly one thing, whether they were alive to argue. Modern neuroscience completely dismantled the ancient belief. We now know memory is stored in distributed neural networks, especially the hippocampus, which does not look romantic enough for ancient poets, so they ignored it. The heart? It's a hard-working pump, but no amount of cardio will make you smarter. Sorry to every gym bro claiming otherwise. But here's the darkly funny twist. Even today, people still talk like ancient philosophers. I feel it in my heart. My heart remembers. Follow your heart. Meanwhile, your brain is up there doing 100 billion tasks a second like, why does no one ever thank me? The truth, your heart beats. Your brain thinks. And ancient wisdom was basically a long, passionate love letter to the wrong organ. Number four, the calming power of mercury. Imagine someone today telling you, Ah, uh, you're stressed. You should drink a little mercury. It calms the spirit. You'd assume they escaped from a laboratory or a TikTok wellness cult. But for centuries, mercury, the shiny liquid metal we now handle with hazmat suits, was considered a healing gift from the gods, a purifier, a rejuvenator, a life-extending elixir. In ancient China, emperors drank mercury tonics believing it granted immortality. Spoiler, it granted the opposite. Mercury poisoning destroys your nerves, brain, kidneys, digestive system. Basically, your entire character arc. But ancient alchemists loved it because it was rare, mysterious, and looked magical. This is the same logic children use when they try to eat glitter. One emperor, Qin Shi Huang, the guy who built the terracotta army, chugged mercury pills believing he'd live forever. Instead, he died at 49, proving that ancient wisdom sometimes had the survival accuracy of a broken GPS. Even outside Asia, mercury had a weirdly glamorous reputation. Medieval Europeans used it to treat syphilis, thinking the intense sweating it caused meant the disease was escaping. In reality, the only thing escaping was the patient's neurological stability. Modern science finally exposed mercury as a neurotoxin that can damage the brain in tiny amounts, the kind of substance you avoid, not sip like herbal tea. But back then, if it shimmered, they swallowed it. If it glowed, they rubbed it on their skin. If it dripped like liquid silver, they called it divine medicine. The darkest irony? Mercury did bring peace, just not the kind anyone wanted. When your nervous system shuts down, you are technically very calm. Ancient alchemy dreamed of immortality. Modern toxicology looked at the results and said, congrats, you discovered fast-track self-destruction. Number three, the moon makes you lose your mind. You've probably heard someone say, full moon tonight, people are acting weird. You may have even believed it. But ancient civilizations took this idea and sprinted straight into cosmic paranoia. The word lunatic literally comes from Luna, the moon goddess. People believed moonlight could scramble your brain, trigger madness, or make you behave unstable. If you had anxiety, seizures, insomnia, or just danced weird at night, the moon was blamed like it was running a celestial prank show. Doctors swore the moon pulled at the watery parts of the brain, just like it pulled the tides, which would be a great theory if the brain were a tide pool and not a jelly-like organ protected by a skull, membranes, and pressure regulation systems. Modern neuroscience has looked at this myth from every angle. Crime rates, psychiatric episodes, ER visits, sleep cycles, seizure frequency. And the hard, cold scientific truth is, the moon does nothing unusual to human behavior. Absolutely nothing. Zero psychological force. Your brain is not a beach. But ancient wisdom refused to let go. Why? Because humans love patterns, even when the patterns don't exist. A weird night happens during a full moon. See? Evidence. Nine normal full moons in a row. Everyone forgets. Confirmation.
Bias, the oldest magician in the world, that said, There is a tiny grain of truth buried in the myth. Before electricity, full moons made nights brighter. Brighter nights meant more nighttime activity. More activity meant more chaos. More chaos meant more stories. And more stories meant ancient people invented a cosmic explanation instead of admitting their nightlife habits lack supervision. Today, when someone blames their bad decisions on the moon, they're really just searching for a poetic excuse. Science says the moon doesn't control your mind. Your impulse control issues do. Number two, spontaneous generation. Life from nothing. Picture this. You leave a piece of meat out overnight, come back the next morning, and it's crawling with maggots. Ancient explanation? The meat created life. Truly, nature is magical. Modern explanation? A fly beat you to it, champ. For thousands of years, people believed in spontaneous generation. The idea that life simply popped into existence from non-living matter. Rotting meat created maggots. Mud produced frogs. Grain birthed mice. If it appeared somewhere you didn't look closely, ancient science said, yep, it grew itself. This wasn't fringe superstition. It was mainstream wisdom taught by philosophers like Aristotle. And honestly, given the tools they had, it seemed logical. Where else did worms come from? No one saw tiny insects laying eggs because no one had a microscope. When all you have is your eyes, nature looks like a spontaneous horror show. The real plot twist came in the 17th and 18th centuries, when scientists like Francesco Redi and Louis Pasteur finally crushed the myth with beautifully petty experiments. Redi covered meat with a cloth. Flies couldn't land. No maggots appeared. Ancient belief, destroyed by woven fabric. Pasteur took it further. He used his famous swan neck flask experiments to prove microorganisms come from other microorganisms, not from random cosmic magic. This single discovery helped launch modern microbiology and finally ended the era of life just happens because why not? The funniest part? People fought this discovery because giving up spontaneous generation meant admitting they had misunderstood life itself for centuries. Humans cling to bad theories the way toddlers cling to broken toys. Science now shows that life emerges from incredibly complex biochemical processes, not from decomposing leftovers auditioning for a horror film. Ancient wisdom said, nature creates life effortlessly. Modern science says, no, life is insanely complicated. You just weren't paying attention. Number one, alchemy's metal to life fantasy. Picture an ancient alchemist sweating over a furnace, proudly declaring he can create life not with cells, DNA, or anything scientific, but with metal, herbs, and a recipe that reads like a crime. For centuries, alchemists believed all matter shared a universal essence. If they could purify it, they thought they could make a homunculus, a tiny artificial human. Some manuscripts genuinely suggested combining metal filings with questionable bodily fluids, as if life were a potion you could accidentally drink. They weren't stupid, just operating without microscopes, genetics, or any idea how biology works. So they assumed nature ran on mystical patterns instead of complex biochemistry. Modern science crushed the dream quickly. Life requires DNA, cells, membranes, enzymes. Systems so complicated that even today, we struggle to define where life truly begins. You can't cook a human out of iron any more than you can turn a toaster into a hamster. But here's the twist. Alchemists failed spectacularly and still ended up laying the groundwork for modern chemistry. Distillation, acids, solutions. These came from their attempts to do the impossible. Ancient wisdom promised magical recipes. Modern science said, nice try, but no, metals do not sprout people. Their results, zero, their legacy, massive, their confidence, unmatched. That's it for today. I'll be doing similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.